Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good evening, everyone. It is Tuesday, June the 13th, 2023. It is currently 9.34 p.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live from the Theology Central studio located right here in Abilene, Texas. You know what it's time for? Take a guess. What do you think it's time for? It's time for the Theology Central, well, email inbox. Do we we need to call this a new, do we need to create a new series? Welcome everyone to the Theology Central email inbox where we get to see all the things that people say to me. No, no, we're not, we're not going to create a series like that, but no, it is time for me to catch up on some older emails. So we're going to go to an email that was sent to me on June the 7th. Yeah, I'm a little behind at 8.44 PM central time. All right. Uh, Okay. Okay. Someone said that they, uh, right before we went live, uh, we were doing kind of our pre-show and uh, there was some motorcycles in the background and someone, uh, someone just said they could hear them a little bit. So good. I hope their parents have those kids off the dirt bikes so that we can do a podcast, but welcome everyone to the Theology Central podcast, where we're going to look at my email inbox and specifically an email that was sent to me again on Wednesday, June the 7th at 8.44 p.m. Central time. Here is how the email reads. Are you ready? Here we go. You may disagree with what the thread says, but I can't think of few more clearly stated defenses of Christian nationalism than this. Let me read that to you again. You may disagree. This is the email that was sent to me on Wednesday, June the 7th, 2023 at 844 PM. You may disagree with what the thread says, but I can think of few more clearly stated defenses of Christian nationalism than this. All right. Now I have been talking for a very long time, first about the political hijacking of American Christianity, turning Christianity to nothing more than an arm of the Republican Party, and how the church, I feel, has prostituted itself for political power and influence. Okay, I, I, I've been talking about that for a very long time. And then I started talking about the rise of Christian nationalism, and that even those, because this is what always happens. You have the rise of an ideology, like say Christian nationalism. It begins to grow in influence. It becomes more and more popular, entering maybe even in, into the mainstream within certain elements of Christianity. But you'll have plenty who'll say, no, 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 it's not Christian nationalism. I am not a Christian nationalist. And then they start talking and it's like, well, you can deny it all day. You can, you can reject the label, but clearly you have taken in, you have bought, you have, you've, in a sense, you've been drinking from the well of Christian nationalism and its ideology because it's starting to influence the way you think. Just because you say you reject an ideology, even if you, you can be sometimes ignorant of the ideology itself, but still be influenced by it. Ignorance of something does not negate its influence upon you. I always say this about church history. Ignorance of church history does not negate its influence upon you. You just don't know you're being influenced by it because you don't know anything about it, right? You don't know anything about church history. And yet people will start saying something like, well, that dates back to 600 AD or that dates back to, and well, just because you don't know it doesn't mean you're not being influenced by it. You just don't know where the influence is coming from. You just don't know what you're drinking from. Well, I believe Christian nationalism has so spread because of the political hijacking of the church that these really, the political hijacking and Christian nationalism has come together to almost form what some people just think is biblical Christianity. And what it's doing is they're redefining biblical Christianity as this new mutated, mutated hybrid of this politicized Christian nationalistic ideology. Is it always pure Christian nationalism? No. Is it always pure politics? No. But it's this weird mutated hybrid. And I, the only thing I know, you may not want to call it 
political hijacking. You may not want to call it Christian nationalism, but I know the one thing you can say, it's not biblical Christianity, okay? That's what I do know. It's something other. It's alien. It's foreign. It's it's a disease, and I don't want anything to do with it. And if that's what you want your Christianity to be, obviously, be my guest. But I think you're 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 rejecting historical, biblical, theological Christianity for a political ideology. You want a politically driven Christianity. You want an ideological driven Christianity instead of a theological and biblical Christianity. By all means, you can pursue that. But for some of us, we're going to be like, nope, sorry, we, we don't have, we don't want anything to do with that. And if that's the direction the church is going to go, more and more people are going to leave the church because they're looking for actual Christianity and not this horrible, horrible, horrible substitute, this horrible alternative that is not, a, it's not the gospel. It's not Christianity. It's something other. I, it's, it's a perversion in my mind. So I have been speaking against it for a very long time, right? So the, this person who's listening, I don't believe, I, I think they sent me an email after. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, they told me, I think on June the 8th, they responded with, they're not a Christian nationalist, but they were wanting me to see it. So the person who sent it is not. I'm assuming if they've listened to me, they definitely know I'm not because I've been speaking against it for a long time. But I feel in many ways Sometimes I feel like I'm like that guy standing on the side of the street, you know, on the on a street corner with a sign saying the end is near and everyone's just walking by going, that guy's crazy. That guy's a lunatic. But I'm going to continue to speak and warn that Christian nationalism and the political hijacking of the church is, I believe, the greatest threat to the church Presently, like use it, it's really weird. There was a time in my Christian life that I thought the threat to Christianity was, you know, um, all the church growth movements, uh, the seeker sensitive kind of philosophy, but a lot of that dealt with the theology of the church. There were times that I felt that the issue with the church was a lack of in-depth biblical teaching, a lack of church history, that people were biblical and biblical and theological illiterate. I thought that there were theological issues, but now I'm just like, can we go back to theological debates? Because now it's like you're talking to people and it's like, that I, I don't even know if we, I don't believe we're even a part of the same quote unquote religion. I don't even know. What you're promoting is like something so foreign. It's like, I can't even have a theological debate with you because you're promoting something that is so other than what I believe. Like you're saying you're defending Christianity. I'm looking at it going, no, you're defending a political party. You're defend, you're defending a political candidate. You're calling for political solutions. We're not even on the same page anymore. We're, we're in a different country. We're in a different universe. So there was a time that I thought the issues were theological. Now, Maybe the issue now is trying to define what Christianity actually is. So I'm very interested to look at this thread. But before we do so, let's do this. What is Christian nationalism? Let's just try to get a basic idea. According to one source, Christian nationalism is a cultural framework that idolizes and advocates a fusion of Christianity with American civic life. Christian nationalism contends that America has been and should always be distinctively Christian from top to bottom. Now, the way you want to make sure the nation stays a Christian nation then is you do so through politics, through law, through political power, through political influence, so that we can then try to demand that everyone else lives like Christians, that everyone else follows Christian morality. In other words, you've abandoned preach the gospel. Now, they would say, no, 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 we still preach the gospel, but you're still trying to impose Christian nationalism or a quote-unquote Christian nation upon the unregenerate. Because your focus is so in trying to impose a Christian nation upon the unregenerate, the gospel gets thrown to the side. Even though you're still saying you're preaching it, I'm sorry. At some point, 
it's going to be hard for people to hear your gospel when all they're hearing is your political efforts to impose a Christian ethic and a Christian worldview upon them. How are they going to hear the gospel when all they're hearing is we're going to get someone elected and we're going to do this and we're going to do this and we're going to boycott this and we're going to silence this and we're going to remove this and we're going to censor this and we're going to do this. We're going to take over. Well, then people are going to be like, I don't even know about your Jesus, but I don't want your political ideology placed upon me. I don't want your, you know, Christian Sharia law placed upon me. And so I, again, I believe Christian nationalism is, is just absolutely destructive and I'm going to continue to stand against it. I understand that I, I may become more and more and more in the minority and I may wake up one day and go, well, (laughs) Whatever that is, I'm not that anymore. Like I, I may look around and go, I don't know. I'm, I'm not going to any church. I'm not because I'm just not a part of any of it. Because to me, the church has just been slowly moving through this evolution of becoming more political, more patriotic, more just more Christian nationalist. And I don't understand why. It's almost like the church. And I say this all the time was looking out the window because, you know, there was a time like there was a lot of people in the church who wanted to kind of isolate ourselves from the world and say, no, 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 we're not of it. Kind of pull out of it. I understand. And then we're looking out the window. And then the church was like, wow, the world's getting really, really bad. And they're, they're becoming more and more less Christian and more and more secular. And they're adopting ideas and philosophies that's antithetical to scripture. What are we going to do? And instead of saying, we need to pray more, we need to fast, we need to, we need to focus on our own Christian lives. We need to present the gospel to people. We need to love our enemies. We need to serve God and we need to minister to other people. Like look for every spiritual thing. Someone said, what we need to do is take our country back. What we need to do is take it back politically. We need to take it back ideologically, we're going to do so through political power and force. And it's like, no, I, I thought it was, we don't fight our war with carnal weapons. I thought it was a spiritual war. We're going to use prayer and fasting and proclamation, but no, no, no. I I think that's what happened. So I know again, the majority of people strongly disagree with my position. I'm very aware of this and that's okay. You can, you can disagree. That's okay. You can take your church and you can take your Christianity down that path. I'm not going with you. I just, all I know, I'm not going with you. And you can call me, you can call me a liberal, a fascist, a communist, a what, I mean, all the names you can, you want to call me. You can call me an unbeliever, but I'm not, I'm not going that direction. I'm going to try to stay committed to a historical, biblical, theological driven Christianity. That's what I'm going to do. So that's a basic idea of what Christian nationalism is. We could add a lot more, but that's a basic idea. So let me go back to the email. Now, remember the email said, you may disagree with what the thread says, but I can think of few more clearly stated defenses of Christian nationalism than this. So according to them, this thread, it's a Twitter thread, is the is I, you know one of the most clearly stated defenses of Christian nationalism. I did not read it in advance because well that would take away the fun of a live broadcast, right? That would that would be like rehearsing it. So I have no idea what's going to be said. I don't know how good this is going to be. I don't know how bad this is going to be. But here we go. All right. The thread it looks like be uh, started at five thirty eight a.m. On June the 5th, 2023, 5.38 a.m., June the 5th, 2023, so far this thread has 71,000 plus views. Wow, that's some serious views, okay? All right, here we go. Well, I think the first tweet had 71,000. It looks like the separate, the the, uh, tweets underneath it may not have as many views. I don't know. I don't know how to read all of the analytics for Twitter, nor do I care to know. But all right, here we go. I'm just saying it looks like a lot of people have read this. Here is what they, how they start. Pastors who keep asking why young reformed people keep being attracted to Moscow, Idaho, apologia, 
right response and the like, the answer is simple. So they're, they're pointing to a lot of churches, Moscow, Idaho, Apologia, right response and the like. Okay. So those are all, I, I, I was ignoring the uh, commas here. So attracted to Moscow, Idaho, in that, um, whose church is in Moscow, Idaho? I always forget his name. Uh, Federalist Vision, Douglas Wilson, I think, is in Moscow, Idaho. I believe it's Douglas Wilson. And then he wrote some booklet about slavery. Yeah, I've, tr- I've tried to stay all out of all of that. Not, I'll just stay away from that, okay? Apologia, know about them. Right response, don't know anything about them. It says the answer is simple. So they're, they're saying, hey, pastors who don't understand why young reform people are going to these particular areas, which I'm assuming many of them are associated with very strong, you may not like the words, but we'll say Christian nationalist ideological things that are, are light or an ideology that is in line to some level with Christian nationalism. I don't want to label these people full-blown Christian nationalists because I'd have to go look at every one of these churches and ministries and go, well, but I think many of these would definitely have ideas that would be in line with certain elements of Christian nationalist ideology. I think that would be fair to say, all right? And of course, obviously the person who emailed me felt the same way. Now, before we go to their defense, Let's just make sure. I don't know if I really care where Young Reformed is going. Because wasn't it the Young Reformed who used to be talking about how amazing Mars Hill, Mars Hill's church was in Seattle and Mark Driscoll? Wasn't the Young Reformed that were like, Mark Driscoll! And that imploded. So I don't, do the Young Young, restless, and reformed crowd, do they always make the right decision in what they're going after? I like, I mean, to me, I don't care what they're going after. I'm more worried about what they believe. And are they mixing reform theology with kind of a nationalistic? That I mean, I don't care where you're going. I guess they're telling me, well, here's the reason they're going that direction. But I don't know if they do they always have a track record of picking the right places? I don't know. You you can you can make your own decision there. But here we here we go. The reason the young reformed are going, are, are, are attracted to Moscow, Idaho, apologia and right response is, they said the answer is simple. Here we go. They're offering an alternative to what many churches have been giving their young people for years, namely a reason to stop spiritual navel gazing, put their faith into action and build something of substance that stand the test of time for the glory of God. So I guess the rest of us, we only offer young people <laughs> the, the we, we call people to spiritual navel gazing. I guess that's what we're doing. Hey, don't build anything of substance. Look and gaze into your navel. I, I, I don't really know exactly how the rest of us do that. Now, when you say builds, put their faith into action and build something of substance, what are you talking about? Put your faith into action by getting involved in politics and culture wars and build something of substance? Are you talking about trying to build a kingdom here on earth? Are you trying to turn this into a Christian nation? Are you trying to fight a spiritual battle with carnal means? Is that what you're referring to? I don't know. I mean, it's a twi- it's a tweet for crying out loud. That's always the problem with you know this. But hey, someone emailed me. My job is to try to analyze it and do the best I can. Let's see what they say next. They're giving young people something to live for instead of just giving them something to die for. Wait a minute. You're telling me biblical Christianity doesn't give you something to live for? Does biblical Christianity only give you something to die for? I think biblical Christianity gives you something to live for. Live your life for Christ. What are you to live your life for? Well, not only his glory. Do you live your life? Obviously, we could go with the you know catechism to enjoy him and glorify him forever. But you live your life to, well, I don't know, love your enemy, turn the other cheek, minister to other people, uh, you know, serving God, loving God, growing in your faith. I, I, d- is biblical Christianity not giving you something to live for unless you're calling for some kind of... Now, again, the, the original reader, the original emailer says this is a defense of Christian nationalism. So I'm going to be responding to some of these tweets in light of it supposedly being a defense of Christian nationalism. I'm not giving the name of the person who said the tweets because I cannot dogmatically assert that's what they're promoting. But if it is, 
I would say that biblical Christianity gives you something to live for just as much as anything else. What I would say, Christian nationalism would give you something to live for that is of no value and profit because you're focusing on this place being your home. You're you're trying to set up a kingdom here. This is not your home. You're a stranger. You're a pilgrim here. Your citizenship is in heaven. That's what render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and render unto God what is God. Give focus on living, focus on the Great Commission, focus on what God calls you to do. But okay, let, let's see what they have next. Next, my faith has been completely, re, re, you know, re energized, you know, been, you know, I guess taken to another level, right? Uh, you know, so okay. Uh, it says, through the work of these churches and ministries, what once seemed blurry in my faith all of a sudden has snapped into focus and added fuel to the already burning fire in my bones. And then they quote Jeremiah 20, 20 verse 9. Okay. I don't know really what Jeremiah 20 verse 9 would have to do with you being reinvigorated, reinvigorated, that's the word they use, reinvigorated um, because of ministries that I guess promote a more get involved in politics and the culture? I, I don't know. Jeremiah 20, verse 9, just interesting since we're, quote, we're currently studying the book of Jeremiah, is Jeremiah 29. Then I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name, but his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. Now this, okay, okay, first of all, all right, oh man, people quoting... Ripping scripture out of context. You know, here's the thing. If you're young and reformed, focus on the scripture and not on ministries trying to get you involved in all of this other nonsense. Because right here, why are you quoting Jeremiah 29? Jeremiah 29 is about Jeremiah, number one. Number two, it's about he's... He's like, I'm not going to preach anymore. I'm just done. I'm not going to preach anymore. But the word of God is like a fuck. The word of God, not some ministry's new ideology. It is the word of God. That's the fire. And even though he doesn't want to preach it anymore, he cannot stop himself. It's the word of God. That's a fire. He's like, hey, these ministries reinvigorated my, my faith. These, these men. No, it should be the word of God. If you look, if your if your faith is reinvigorated, if your faith is fired up because of me, you're 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 I'm sorry. You you're 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 not reinvigorated spiritually. You're reinvigorated fleshly. If you're reinvigorated by the word of God, if you're fired up by the word of God, not by a ministry, but by scripture, that's the right way. Not Jeremiah didn't go, oh, there was a ministry telling me to be more involved in the culture. No, he was just to deliver a message to the culture, right? So we, we should preach the word of God. Now, I know, I know this person may not be saying that. It's just don't connect the burning from Jeremiah 29 with ministries. You can say, well, that ministry preached the scriptures, but it's not the ministry that reinvigorated you. It's the word of God. It's the word of God that's sharper than any two edges. It's not me. If, if, if it's not anyone, if, if when you focus on the person, you reinvigorated my faith, you changed me, you know, it's the word of God. If it's me, then, then if it's anybody else, then that, that's the whole, the whole thing. You've lost the plot. It's the word of God that does so. If that makes sense. All right. They go, they go on to say, and although eschatology has some significant part to play in this, it's not just about eschatology. It's bigger than that. It's about having a practicing faith that actually takes God at his word and is busy being obedient to it. Right. Because if you're not a Christian nationalist, you're not. I say that's just disingenuous. That's just not. Now, I'm not saying this is what the person is saying. I'm saying the person who emailed me said this is a defense of Christian nationalism. If it is, well, then this would be saying their view is the one that's going to get you to, you know, practice and your faith and actually take God at his word. Look, there's people who are not Christian nationalists. There's people who have no part of any of those ministries, uh, Moscow, Idaho, Apologia, any of those. And they take God's word just as serious. OK, I, I always get tired of, you know, we take God's word serious and nobody else does. Just stop that nonsense, okay? That's not true. 
Just because someone disagrees with you doesn't mean they're sitting around navel gazing, not putting their faith into practice. It, it doesn't mean that they don't take God's word seriously. It just means they disagree with you. Right? Is, is that not possible? Okay. All right. But let's see where they're going to go here. All right. Um, in other words, they're not wishy-washy on anything. And it's attractive very attractive to young Christians who feel useless in the secular world and these pietistic churches that have no backbone against the secular world. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, now, now I'm going to, now this is starting to feel a little bit more Christian nationalist because people will tell me I don't take, a, I don't have a backbone against the world. Like when everyone was so upset about Sam Smith and Kim Petras at the Grammys because they did Unholy and everybody was like, oh, my goodness, we've got to do something. Satan was being worshipped. The, the world. And I was like, yeah, okay, who cares? And people are like, you have no backbone. You don't take a stand. I'm going to take a stand against lost people acting like lost people. What, what, what exactly would you want me to do? You want them banned from the airwaves? Well, then they could want Christians banned from the airwaves. Do you want to, what do you want me to do? Declare a war on them? How about, I don't know, you could pray for them? Oh, that, that's a novel idea. You could pray for them. There you go. Or here's a, here's a novel idea, Christians. Okay, I know. Okay, listen to me. Just listen to me. All right, this just in. Sometimes when lost people act like lost people, and then we get all up in arms, and we gonna we're gonna have we're gonna show that we have a backbone, and we're gonna yell about it and protest it and try to boycott it. Or all you do is draw attention to it, because the controversy of that Grammy performance, the song Unholy was only streamed probably a billion more times. The performance was probably viewed a million more times on YouTube and other social media platforms because people wanted to see what all the controversy was about. You only drove more people to it. You didn't drive more people away from it. That's been going on forever. So I, what do you mean? To, I don't have to take it. Look, here's the thing. I don't, I, 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 I can't stand when people say you don't have any backbone against the secular world because I don't yell and scream about what the world is doing. I will preach against what they're doing, the sin of what they're doing, right? Right. Hey, this is sin. This is sin. This is sin. This is sin. But I'm good. You should be willing to preach as much against our sins as you do their sins, right? Shouldn't you be as wor more worried about our sins than their sins? They're unbelievers. What they need is Christ. It's it's so it's so weird. It's like it's like there's a switch in the minds of Christians now that we need to have a backbone and scream at the world and tell them stop doing bad things, stop being naughty. We just want you to act nice. Is that our message? That we want to just make them stop doing bad things? Isn't the message should be, hey guys, you're a sinner, just like I'm a sinner. You sin in these ways. And I sin in these ways. And even if we don't look to our actions, we're all sinners and guilty in Adam. And we all have a sinful nature. So guess what, guys? We're all sinners. And our only hope is the finished work of Jesus Christ because we can never keep God's law. But it's like Christians now just want to win debates, win arguments, and make the world stop being bad in public because you make me uncomfortable. What do you mean I don't have a, that churches who don't get involved in the culture wars have no backbone against the secular? I don't. I'm so tired of hearing that. I'm, I, I'm, I'm literally I've grown weary of hearing that nonsense. You won't take stand against ungodliness. I preach against ungodliness when I get to a text that condemns a specific sin. I'm going to preach then that's a sin. Thus says the Lord. You're like, but what do you do if you see them doing that sin on the Grammys? Okay. If I get to the text that preaches against it, I mean, what, what, I mean, first of all, 
Why are Christians watching? I mean, if you're so offended, why were Christians watching the Grammys in the first place, right? I mean, didn't you know that the Grammys were going to do something that was going to offend? I, I predicted it before the Grammys even aired that Sam Smith and Kim Petras was going to do something that was going to offend everyone because they were performing the song Unholy for crying out loud. What do you think? A performance of the song Unholy. Do you think that could be just, I don't know, possibly controversial? Give me a break. Obviously, it was going to be. So why were Christians, why, oh, Christians weren't watching it. Christians heard about it, then wanted to scream about it because either you were watching it, which I don't know why you'd be watching the Grammys if you're so worried about what the world is doing and you're so offended by it. And if you weren't watching it, then why are you getting upset about something you didn't watch? You're like, well, I've got to take a stand. Don't you already preach against maybe the sins that were being spoken or promoted or glorified? In it, I mean, like, I, I just, I don't get it. So it's always like, you don't have a backbone. We go, what, what do you want us to do? What do you want us to do? What, what do you want to do? You want to yell and scream at the culture for acting according to their nature? Now, I'm not saying we justify it. I'm not saying, hey, guys, you see what the world is doing? That's right. I'm not saying that. I'm saying we preach what the Bible says, and then that can be easily applied to the sins in the church and outside the church. I mean, I mean let me see. Which what should bother you more? Let this let's just do a little test. What should we be more upset about? Sam Smith and Kim Petras performing unholy at the Grammys or all the children who've been sexually abused inside churches. I don't know which which one should possibly get us more fired up. What should get us more fired up? What's being sold in a Target store that I am not forced to buy in any way shape or form? Or all the children who've been sexually abused in churches. What should get us more upset? Bud Light. <laughs> Wait, uh, Christians are upset about Bud Light? Like, uh, I, I, maybe we should talk about your drinking. I don't know. Okay, but I digress. I digress. Um, or, I, again, should we be more upset about the sins there or the sins inside our own lives? I'm not saying we ignore those sins, and I'm not saying we justify those sins. But I, I don't like when Christians start making some argument that, again, as they say it, in other words, they're not wishy-washy on anything, and it's attractive, very attractive to young Christians who feel useless in the secular world. How do you feel useless in the secular world? And these pietistic churches that have no backbone against the secular world, how do we have no backbones against the secular world? They go on to say, I'm, I'll forever be grateful for uh, Christ, underscore, under uh, Kirk, Apologia Studios, and Right Response. I love them and their work, Sola de Gloria. Thought I should add that my church is fantastic and not like the churches I described in this thread at all. My pastors, the elders, and the people at my church are the absolute best. I really did hit the jackpot with finding a faithful church. I'm just speaking to a broader issue. And then someone mentioned underneath that, uh, interesting that there was no mention of the scriptural command to share the gospel, only works-based ideas. <laughs> and it was a, a woman who said that. I just find it, I find it... I just find it funny. I just find it funny. Okay, but all right, because sometimes I think women are better the theologians than men. All right, but all right. Nothing wrong with Christians owning businesses and such, but this fallen world is not our eternal home. Sharing the love and salvation of Jesus is primary. Wow. That's, uh, that's pretty good. Hi, my dear sister. Thanks for sharing your thoughts. I completely understand your position and I wholeheartedly agree that sharing Jesus is primary. I just know that some pastors wonder why young people like those guys so much. This thread was response to that. All love to you. All right. Um, Okay. I'm just looking at some of the other things here. Uh, um, okay, I don't know. I don't know what that has to do with anything. All right. Uh, there is a tremendous opportunity to win this generation of young men to Christ. 
that the vast majority of the American church is sleeping through. Praise God for the few that know what time it is and are acting accordingly. Are you winning people to Christ because you're giving them an ideology about, I guess, I don't know, trying to build some kind of Christian national? I don't, I don't even know how that was a good defense for Christian nationalism now that I'm reading it. Um, Okay, then someone has, someone says, yes, yes. Then they have a, um, a, a kind of an image where it looks like uh, the Crusaders marching with flags. It look, yeah, it's the Crusaders. It's like a kind of a, an, an image. It's, it's Crusaders. Like, like, are you literally, people read that and their first thought is back to the Crusades. Is that what we want? Armed men with swords marching to conquer the nations in the name of Christ through military force? Like, why would you have an image after that thread that says yes, and then have an image here of basically the Crusaders? Like, is, is that what Christians are, are fired up for? Let's dress in armor, get a sword and go conquer in the name of Jesus. Like if, if you're why if you think the Crusades was a good thing, I'm sorry, I'm out. Get, get me out of your church. Get me as far away from you as humanly possible. I'm running for my absolute life. In fact, just get me out of this country. Go, I'm just, I'm just going to go as far. That is insane. I don't want to go back to the Crusades. I don't want to go back to people being slaughtered. Uh, I, I don't want. I don't want war and violence in the name of Jesus. I do not want that. Ah, man, that is crazy. Um. Okay, um, and I'm reading more here. Okay, here we go. Uh, so someone else, so a rejection of pietism. Someone says a rejection of pietism. Someone else says three issues with many churches. They don't teach the Bible or do it well. Uh, too many pastors are cowards, preferring to be tone police instead of addressing cultural issues biblically. These two traits result in too many pastors being indistinguishable from the culture. So, you know, there was always people telling us pastors how to do things, right? So I do believe that there is a lack of biblical teaching because biblical illiteracy continues to run rampant. But the answer to biblical illiteracy is not Christian nationalism or saying, let's build a Christian kingdom here. And again, I'm so tired of being told that uh, we that the church needs to address cultural issues biblically. Now, it depends on what you mean by that, right? Like, you say, "Hey, this is like this is how I would address it." And the culture right now, this is the new ideology. As Christians, we can't believe that ide- ideology because the Bible says this. Now, if you if you want to turn it into the culture has got it wrong and we need to do something and we need to get someone elected into office and we need to take over here and we need to do this and we and, and we're we need to fight the culture. See, that's where it's ridiculous. I don't need to fight the culture. I need to preach to the culture. I need them to hear. I need to hear, see their sin, turn to Christ and be converted, then teach them to obey. The teaching to obey follows conversion. I don't force obedience through any other means. All right. Um, and then someone says Christians are being are, are beginning to realize that culture neutrality isn't all what it's cracked up to be. In fact, it's actually just evil. Once again, I've got to go be trying to, you know, stop the culture. Um, the federal vision, which is alive and well in Moscow, isn't, re- isn't reformed theology. It's more akin to the soteriology of Rome. Young reformed people can and should do better. Yeah, that, that Moscow, Moscow, Idaho, that's federal vision. That's what I thought. And someone here points it out. How long did Calvin's Geneva project, project last? Something to think about, maybe. It's true. How, how the, look, <laughs> Calvin's Geneva, pro- okay, let me just make it very clear. What, any time, this is, oh man, oh man. First of all, I didn't even see that that thread was even a decent 
attempt to defend Christian nationalism. I, that's my own personal opinion. To the person who thought it was an amazing defense of Christian nationalism, I would say if that's the best Christian nationalism Christian nationalism has, then it's completely bankrupt in defending itself because that was not a defense in any way, shape, or form. All right, that's my own opinion. But let me say this: this person points out a good point. How long did Calvin's Geneva Project? happen right now just know throughout church history there's a constantly these times where you merge in a sense church and state now i've taught my people in my church this forever whenever we study church history whenever you merge church and state together people are going to die because the church will then say this is the law this is the law this is the law based off scripture then the government, right, the civil authority will come in and then punish people for so-called biblical crimes or biblical sins, and people get put to death. Now, it's great when you're, in, when you're in charge, when your church is in charge, when your theology is in charge, it's wonderful, right? Because you're not dying. Other people are dying. Oh, you're not a Calvinist? You die. You don't believe in the Trinity? You die. You don't believe in this? You die. You committed this sin? You die. You're a heretic? You die. You're a charismatic? You die. You're a Catholic? You die, right? Or you're punished or you're put in prison or, or you can't own property or whatever the rules are going to be. It's great when your theology is in charge. But the minute your theology is not in charge, then all of a sudden, like, no, the Catholics took over. Then the Protestants start dying or the Lutherans take over. Well, the Anabaptists start dying. Whatever the case may be, it's just insane. That's, that's the last thing anyone should want. What we should want is a system where there's a separation of church and state and the state lets the church preach and teach its message. It does not get involved in that. We preach and teach, call people to faith in Christ and say, this is what the, how the gospel calls us to live. Live this way. And then we live that way in the world. We're not of it in the sense that we're not uh, partaking in their ideologies and their ideas. We live different. We stand out like peculiar to the world. They're like, well, wait a minute. They don't do this and they don't do this and they don't pursue this and they don't do this. Why not? Well, because we're strangers here. We're pilgrims here. This is not our home. We're, our, our citizenship is in heaven. We're going to live out our faith in this world, but we're not of this world. That's what we should want. And we just want the government to give us that freedom to do so. And guess what we want? If we want that freedom, then we want people of other faiths and other religions and other lifestyles to have their freedoms because the freedoms you deny them are freedoms you'll ultimately deny yourself. So if you run around trying to get all these books removed from the library, someone will come along and then try to get the Bible removed from the library or Christian books. If you try to get... The Grammys removed from the airwaves. Well, then people will try to get TBN removed from the airwaves. And guess what? If I have to choose which one to get pulled from the airwaves, is it the Grammys or charismatic television? I want charismatic television removed from the airwaves. I'll have that one removed before I go after the Grammys. Right? So that's just like, how does that work? You want freedom. You want freedom. Okay. Yeah. Freedom. Now, when that freedom begins to hurt other people in a damaging way or has a problem, then that's where we can say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now we may have some issues here with like now your freedom is hurting other people. Your freedom is hurting that person and that person, that person, right? Just like there's limits to freedom. You can't, you may have freedom of speech, but you can't stand up in the theater and scream fire because that can create panic and people can get hurt and die. And then that would be a problem, right? There's limits, but you want as much freedom as humanly possible that you have your freedom and I have my freedom. I, I want you to have, in a sense, I want you to have the freedom to be wrong and I want the freedom to be right, right? And I want the freedom to be able to criticize your wrong and I want you to have the freedom to criticize my right if you believe you're right, you know? So, but it's weird that this thread, I guess, obviously the people reading it perceive it to be Christian nationalism. I was trying to be nice and say, well, maybe... Um. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't see this as some grand defense of Christian nationalism, but I wanted to at least bring it to everyone's attention. I, I thought there was going to be something better in it, but you know, that's, I, I see a, a kind of a complete misapplication of Jeremiah twenty nine. And all I see is really, hey, everyone else is doing it wrong, but these groups are doing it right. And, and everyone else is weak and spineless and we don't stand up to the culture. 
I, I just, I don't know what Christians, why do we want to fight the culture? I just don't understand it. I just don't know why. <laughs> Whatever the culture is doing tonight, it has no bearing on me. I may completely disagree with what they're doing. Okay. I, I will preach against it whenever I come to a passage and say, hey, this uh, guy, this is a sin. This is wrong. I know we live in a society where everyone's practicing it, but it's wrong. Okay, next. I'm not going to like, hey, guys, we need to organize a boycott. We need to go after it. We need to silence it. We need to get rid of it because we're going to make them live like us. Why would you want an unregenerate person to try to live as a Christian? Do you realize that that's a flawed idea? How well did Israel do trying to live according to God? Oh, wait, God's law condemns and reveals sin. Nobody can keep it. I think it's a whole destruction of law and gospel. I do understand it, this requires a whole different system of eschatology. Yeah, we can get into a whole discussion of eschatology. So is the issue in, in one of eschatology? I don't know. I think it's one that we just want to fight with people. I don't know. Does, does, does what the culture does? I mean, I'm more bothered by my own sin. I'm bothered more by the sins inside the church than I am what's going on outside. I don't know. How do you feel about it? Do you see... You know, so, and I'm just, and the only reason I'm using the Grammy example over and over and over is because I got, I got, I think even if you go on the Sermons 2.0 app and look under comments, you'll see there's at least one comment there. Maybe there's some on face uh, on YouTube. And I think there was a lot of emails. People were very upset that I was just like, yeah, so who cares? They used an, a over the top controversial performance. And you know why you do that in music? Because you generate more buzz and you get more listens. That's been going on in music forever. Do something controversial at the parents yell and scream, and then the kids want to go listen to it more and more and more. You don't accomplish anything. Now, I know right now we're in a cultural shift because people were so gained, they felt like they accomplished something by boycotting Bud Light and Bud Light lost all of that money. So now there's a, they're emboldened right now. We're making change. We're making change. Because you know what? If you remove those items from Target, I, I, don't you feel good? I mean, how many people came to Christ for doing that? I mean, don't you feel better? Okay. Or, or uh, hey, Bud Light lost all of this money. Aren't you glad that you hurt the company financially. I mean, I don't know how much you actually hurt the big company. You may have hurt local distributors and local store, but okay, but whatever. Okay. Uh, but you feel like you've accomplished something, but what are you feeling like you accomplished? People don't drink Bud Light now. Woohoo! Look at us. We're making, we're making inroads for Jesus. They're just drinking other beers. <laughs> Hey, hey, they can't buy those things at Target. I know they can just order them on Amazon, right? right? Uh, someone here said, um, all right, someone said that they definitely uh, can see how easy it is to get wrapped up in this hype. I, I, you may be right. I, I have a hard time knowing. I, I can't see getting wrapped up in it, but I, I guess I can see that. I think the main people many times have eschatological reasons, but another thing is uh, the hype, uh, the, re, the you know reinvigorating your your faith uh, in a sense, uh, as uh, put in the feed, right? So yeah, you reinvigorate your faith, and once you reinvigorate your faith, I guess then you feel the hype or the hype. I, I don't know. I I think I think eschatology is a part of it. I don't know. I don't know what it is. I, my here's my own personal. Here's my own personal take, and I'll end with this. And I know this is gonna nobody's gonna agree with me on this, and that's okay. Here's my here's my hypotheses. Christianity was biblically illiterate. That, that's just a fact. Oh, you go back 
to the late 80s, early 90s, there were Christian leaders all over the place screaming, we're in trouble. The Christians are becoming more and more biblically illiterate. They're not reading their Bible. They're not studying their Bible. They don't know how to study their Bible. I remember early on, way back uh, when uh, I, I, I could go, I could go back. I don't even know how early I preached that series. There was a sermon I preached, uh, maybe... It had to be early 2000, 2001, and I screamed about the biblical illiteracy of the church. Uh, oh, there. Okay, someone's saying there could be a crowd mentality to it. I agree, but here's my here's my take. All right, here's my take. So, if I go back, I believe it was the late 1990s or the early 2000. I preached a sermon, and in the sermon, I had all of these quotes from seminary professors and ministries and statistics about how biblically illiterate Christians were, right? I remember way back in the early 2000s, I think it was the White Horse Inn, they were going to these Christian conferences and asking Christians these questions about theology, and it was horrifying, absolutely horrific, right? They didn't know any theological, it was bad. And I remember listening to this, and I remember White Horse Inn was saying, we got a problem, the church is biblical illiterate, theologically illiterate. And in this illiteracy that was sweeping across the church, churches were becoming social clubs. It was fun, food, activity. The church was being designed for the unbeliever instead of ministering to the believer. They were feeding goats instead of, they were entertaining goats instead of feeding sheep. You remember when all the ministries were screaming about this? Everything from fighting for the faith, white horse in, everyone was talking about uh, what what is happening. Uh, MacArthur was writing books like The Sufficiency of, of Christ because Christians were were not turning to the sufficiency of scripture or the sufficiency of Christ. They were turning to pragmatism and all of, and turning to politics and turning to these other, there were all these warnings. And it, I believe it was that soil of biblical illiteracy. It was this soil of a church that was becoming more entertainment than biblically minded that something started happening. That slowly but surely, because these people were biblically illiterate, they were being more entertained than they were actually being fed scripture. They weren't theologically driven. This theological and biblical ignorance was the soil in which something was planted. And what was planted was the politicizing of the church. And the church started embracing politics more than it was embracing Christ. And little by little, the church was becoming more and more political, more and more political, more and more political. It was slow. And then the church was given a test. That test was Donald Trump. We were given Donald Trump. And the question was, was the church going to pass the Donald Trump test or not? And the church went all in. Donald Trump is our savior. Donald Trump is here to fix everything. And the church threw its full support upon Donald Trump. Evangelicals came out in large numbers to put him in the White House. Not only did they put him in the White House, they started defending anything and everything he would say and do. And we started talking and acting like him instead of acting like Christ. Fox News started becoming more influential to Christians than the Bible because the the, the church had already moved away from the Bible. It already started becoming more and more political. And as it became more and more political, then these ministries that promoted an eschatology and an ideology... That was like, we're going to take back this country. We're going to make it Christian. We're going to fight for it. We're going to do this. They just naturally fall into that because they've already been politically hijacked. I think it's the result of the political hijacking of the church that started because the church was theologically and biblically illiterate. Now, once that starts, a crowd mentality follows. Hype follows. Manipulation follows. I I definitely will agree with that. People's faith is supposedly being reinvigorated, but it's being reinvigorated not because of Christ, but because of an ideology, because of winning culture wars. Look what we've done. We look how much money Bud Light has lost. Look how much money Target. Let's go for Let's go after everyone. Now we'll see how long this lasts. We'll see. We'll see. 
Typically, these will lose steam. And then next thing you know, Bud Light will just be making money again. Target will be right back and things will move on. Typically, this stuff only lasts for a while. We will see. They say that that's a great defense of Christian nationalism. I personally don't believe that it is. Obviously, many people underneath it believed it to be referring to Christian nationalism, especially if you're posting an image of the Crusaders from the Crusades. I mean, that's insane to me, that that image. And I remember when we had our Discord channel, we had someone coming in who clearly was buying into QAnon stuff, and they would post these images that definitely were kind of related to the Crusades. And people in like armor with a cross. And I'm like, oh my goodness gracious, what is happening here? And clearly the person didn't want to even talk about actual theology or the Bible. It was this crazy QAnon stuff with this image, this, it, these images basically of like the Crusades. And you're like, what is happening? And then, then it, well, then our whole site got hacked by someone with QAnon and got deleted. And yeah, I don't want to go back through that whole mess again, because anytime I talk against these things, I usually end up getting attacked by Christian nationalists and QAnon people. But I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I, I just, look, the person emailed me. I wanted to do my best to address it. I wish I could offer maybe a better way of addressing it, but I don't really know what to say because I don't really think those tweets gave much. I think there's probably better books out there that give a far better defense of Christian nationalism. There's probably better sermons out there that give a better defense of Christian nationalism. Um, and uh, every time I hear a defense of Christian nationalism, it just makes me question, uh, you know— all of Christianity, because I feel like more and more Christians are thinking that way. Even those who would not be would not identify or even be classified as a Christian nationalist, it's influencing their thinking. The politicizing of the church is a cancer, and it's spreading, and it's it's terminal. I think, um, as far as a large portion of the church, and many of and many Christians are like, I'm not going back to that. I'm staying out of that. I'm not. I don't know what's happening. I'm, I can't do that. I, I, I had someone message me, what, two days ago, basically saying they haven't been to church in two years because all the churches are these Trump-supporting, flag-waving, patriotic, Republican. That's that's what they are. And 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 if when you're not that, you feel like an outsider. Well, that's horrible if someone's been driven out of the church because of politics. I have another person who sometimes will email me, and a lot of times they will they will end their email with something like, I just want my church back. And you're just like, that, that's horrific. But the people in the church doesn't care. They're like, you don't support Trump. You don't love America. And you're, you're an ungodly heathen. Okay. Well, they, or I just, I'm a Christian and what you're, you're putting forth and you're promoting is not Christianity. Do you ever think about that? But I do believe there's a follow the crowd mentality, a hype mentality. And I think eschatology, I think there may be an, es uh, an eschatological shift happening in the church. There could be to a more, uh, to eschatologies that would call for more of like, you know, we're going to build the kingdom here. We're going to, we're going to establish the kingdom here versus, you no, know, we live out our Christian life here. And when God wants the kingdom established here, and let's say we go with a literal kingdom, thousand years, he'll come back with a sword and he'll do that. Not us. We just live out our faith. We're ready. We're looking for Christ and we're preaching and call people to repentance and faith. But those are radically different approaches. But if you think Donald Trump is the one to save us, <laughs> man, no. wow, we got, we got issues. But email me your disagreements to newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. That's newsif at yahoo.com. That's newsif at yahoo.com. To the person who emailed me, thank you very much for sending this. It was interesting. I, I don't see it really as a good defense of Christian nationalism. That's my own personal opinion. Obviously, the people underneath the thread, for the most part, loved it. The one person who stood against it, for the most part, was a woman. <laughs> and once again, uh, you know, uh, I, I, would, I think women are better at theology than anybody else. Um, Oh, true. Oh, this is a good point. Oh, this is good. Uh, someone just said, well, you have the charismatic version and the re reform type version. That is an interesting point. 
you do have kind of the charismatic kind of leading to a kind of a Christian nationalistic political, you know, was it called the seven mountain mandate? I think it's called the seven mountain mandate. Like we're going to, we're going to take over culture. And then you got more of the reformed perspective. So it comes from both sides. That's interesting. That is a good point. And again, it's a woman who figured it out. See, I'm just going to give up. I think women should just take over Christianity. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm Joe. I'm going to, I'm going to get myself in trouble. I just know that's the hot topic right now because of Southern Baptist and fighting and Rick Warren and everyone's upset about, okay, I'm just joking. I know what the Bible seems to indicate about women, but just because they may not be a pastor, they, they should be listened to because in many cases they have more, uh, yeah, it's kingdom now, seven mountain. And then the theonomy uh, post mill. Yeah, right. So see, she's got it all down. I, I don't even need to do anything. I'm just going to retire. I'm going to send my microphone to her and she can just do her own podcast. There's no point in me doing it anymore. I give up. But now, kingdom now, seven mountain, theonomy, and post mill. And, that, and, and a lot of that's coming from different sides, say the charismatic side and the reform side. And some of us are just like, you're all crazy. We don't want nothing to do with any of that. I definitely want nothing to do with the charismatic side. I don't want anything to do with theonomy or post mill. None. Zero. Get me as far away from these sides as humanly possible. You guys go try to take over the world. And all that's going to do is create a situation where the church is going to be persecuted. And you know why we're going to be persecuted? We're going to be persecuted not because of Christ, but because we're basically trying to impose almost a form of theocracy of some sort. All right. I've gone 60 minutes. See what happens when I try to answer an email. Thanks for the uh, feedback and the input. Um, but there's a lot of you who know more about this stuff than me. The reason I, a lot of these things, I uh, just so that you know, is I try my best not to chase, like you can go down some dark, dark tunnels chasing all of this stuff and watching all of these theologies develop. And I, maybe I should watch it more. I've been watching Chris Rosebro on Fighting for the Faith. I told you he was starting to talk about Christian nationalism. And it just seems like that's all he talks about, like right lately. Or at least I think I've seen him on like uh, social media and some places. And it just seems like, like that's his that's his thing right now. And it's awesome that he's fighting Christian nationalism, but I could not, I don't, man, I, I have no desire to spend my life fighting that battle. I would rather rest studying the book of Jeremiah, right? That's what I would rather be doing. But there's times you do have to address it, which then requires maybe spending more time looking into it. So maybe I do need to look more into it, but try to find that balance. Because typically, I don't, I don't know how successful you can be. People who get full blown into Kingdom Now, Seven Mountain, Post Mill, Theonomy. I mean, I don't know. Is there, is there an easy way to pull them back out of it? I don't know. Just like, can we just get back to the Bible and living out our Christian faith? And But they would say that they are trying to take the Bible and live it out. So they would claim that they are. So I don't know. Newsif at yahoo.com. Newsif at yahoo.com. Everyone have a wonderful, wonderful evening. Thanks for listening. And to the emailer, thank you. Sorry it took so long to get to it. There's a lot of other, there's a lot of other emails that I have not responded to. I trust me, I'm always looking at them, looking for ones I can address in a podcast. Uh, I will try to get to it. Just if you ever think I have forgotten your email, just resend it. Just say, oh, you can just friendly reminder. I sent this on this date and there it is. And I will see what I can do. All right. Someone wanted me to cover the, the, the documentary. I guess it's on Amazon prime. Uh, the Duggars is it the Duggars and, uh, I, I don't really know what to say about it. I never, I don't, I never understood why people got involved in that reality show in the first place. And uh, like, yeah, I know that there, it goes into some other things that they were looking at. And I know uh, my daughter's called me about it a million times. And I'm like, I don't know. I don't want to watch this. I don't want to watch some documentary about craziness that happened in the name of Christ. I don't know. But yeah, so I, I can't really say much about it because I, I don't even know if I want to watch it, but Yeah. Yeah, so there you go. All right. Newsif at yahoo.com. Newsif at yahoo.com. Everyone have a great night. We'll be back tomorrow. God bless.